Good morning, and welcome to the video service for the dual parish of Grace and St. John Lutheran Churches on this fifth Sunday of Easter, which also happens to be Mother's Day. Uh, so we give thanks to all the mothers that are in our life. You know, Mother's Day is a day that touches us all. In, and in today's um, uh, readings and sermon, we're going to learn about grace and power. And you know, grace and power are, are two things, essential ingredients that mothers need to do their mothering. Uh, so we, again, we give thanks to our mothers, and I do pray that uh, if uh, you have a mother in the area or, or um, your mother's around, that uh, you're able to take her out for some sort of a, whatever a quarantine brunch might look like, or at least uh, maybe pick up the phone and uh, give mom a call and say thank you uh, for being mom. All right, uh, just as a reminder, uh, we are going to be starting that 1 Corinthians Bible study coming up this Wednesday, May 13th. So just as a reminder for that, um, if you'd like to learn more about the gospel of Jesus Christ, eugenics, church discipline, uh, marriage, spiritual gifts, things like this that are covered in 1 Corinthians, I do encourage you to sign up and register for that Bible study uh, using the link that I sent out in an email earlier this week, or um, find a way to get a hold of me if, if you're not sure how to register. I'll make sure that you get registered for the six week 1 Corinthians Bible study starting this Wednesday, May 13th. We will be following along in the service of prayer and preaching this morning on page 260 of your hymnal, so put a bookmark there. Our opening hymn is hymn number 645, Built on the Rock. We rise as we sing. Sacrifice and 
bells are ringing. Many in saving faith may come, where Christ his message is bringing. I know my own, my own, know me. I leave with you. Amen. We continue on page 260 with a service of prayer and preaching. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Sanctify us in your truth. Your word is truth. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. At this time, we continue with the singing of the Old Testament canticle on page 261 of your hymnal. And you will say in that day, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, proclaim that his name is exalted.
The first reading for the fifth Sunday of Easter is from Acts chapters 6 and 7. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians and of the Alexandrians, and of those from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. And Stephen said, Brothers and fathers, hear me. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did not your fathers persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered, you who received the law as delivered by angels, and did not keep it. Now, when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from 1 Peter chapter 2. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up to salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, 
that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel, which is taken from St. John, the 14th chapter. Jesus said, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where, you're, where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, Show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his work. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue with the responsory on page 263 of your hymnal. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. We continue by reading the Catechism together on page 264 of your hymnal, beginning with the Ten Commandments. The first commandment, You shall have no other gods. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. We confess our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. We confess, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, 
From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And let us pray together the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. At this time, we continue with our hymn of the day. Sincerity and love 
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. In our first reading from the book of Acts this morning, from Acts chapter 6 and 7, we learn about St. Stephen. Yes, the very same St. Stephen that we sing about around Christmas time, you know, when good King Wenceslas looked out on the feast of Stephen. It is that same Stephen that we learn about in the book of Acts this morning. For it is there we learn about uh, Stephen and his life and ministry and service to the church, the very early Christian church, just uh, uh, very young in its age at this point in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 6 and 7, we get the book ends in our reading this morning, we get the book ends of Stephen's uh, life and service to the church. For we start in chapter 6 with Stephen being chosen to serve the church as a deacon, uh, one who helps with the various kind of charitable um, endeavors of the church, especially in this case, uh, serving the widows. And, and Stephen is chosen Uh, as one of seven men to serve the church as deacons because of their wisdom, their spiritual maturity, as indeed all leaders of the church should have a certain level of maturity and wisdom and knowledge in the scriptures. And then at the other end of the uh, account of Stephen's service, we get the account of Stephen's martyrdom, uh, his being stoned to death by the council for his witness to Jesus Christ. And it is from this uh, account of Stephen, we learn of our witness to Christ, how our witness to Jesus Christ should be. Namely, it should be full of grace and power. Grace and power in our witness to Christ For Acts chapter 6, verse 8, says this about St. Stephen. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Full of grace and power. Uh, Such was Stephen's witness in his witness to Jesus Christ. So I want to consider those two elements of Stephen's witness, his grace and his power, in turn. So we will start with grace. Uh, First, Stephen spoke gracious words in his witness to Jesus Christ. Now these words were gracious words, words of grace, because they were words which would lead people, those who heard, it would lead people back to God's mercy. That was the point of Stephen's witness, to to bring people back into the fold of God's mercy and forgiveness Uh, when they put their trust in Jesus Christ and and have all their sins washed away in holy baptism. Now, of course, the people who Stephen was witnessing to, the the Jewish council, the the priests and such who didn't believe in Jesus, uh, when they heard of Stephen's witness, they could not refute him from the scriptures. But instead, uh, they got angry with him and and they even brought uh, people to slander him and to accuse him falsely. And when Stephen was slandered, we see his gracious response because he did not attack his slanderers back. He didn't even try to, uh, with, he didn't even try to, defend himself. In Acts uh, 6.10, Luke, the writer of Acts, tells us that that those who heard Stephen's witness, they could not withstand his wisdom. They could not withstand his wisdom. And so they resorted to attack his character personally. And as I mentioned, they brought the false accusations against him. This is what is known as ad hominem, a Latin term for against the man. And this is a term in argumentation where when um, someone attacks their opponent 
personally rather than addressing their argument. And you know you're on the losing side of an argument when you can't address the argument at hand, but you have to resort to simply attacking the person that you're arguing with. And so the council brought these false accusations against Stephen, and eventually we also know from chapter 7 that the false accusations went from violent words to violent actions when they ended up stoning Stephen to death. Now, uh, this is shocking to us and, and surprising uh, that anyone would do this for a simple um, just being witnessed to about Jesus Christ, that it would produce that level of hate and violence. And yet, we need to remember the words of our Lord from Matthew chapter 10, where Jesus said, You will be hated by all for my name's sake. Our Lord promised that this would be the reaction, at least of some, to the witness of the gospel. Certainly it was the case for Stephen in his witness to Jesus Christ. Now how does Stephen respond even to when he is being stoned? Stephen responds with words of grace, for he says, He prays to the Lord, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Those are gracious words, if ever we heard any gracious words. As he is being stoned, he is praying. He is praying for his attackers' forgiveness, even as they are in the act of murdering him. Now, the account of of Stephen's, Stephen's martyrdom is very fascinating because in many ways, in many ways, it mirrors the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. Even as our lives mirror the crucifixion of Christ in our baptism when we are buried with Christ through the waters of baptism and then raised again with him to new life in the forgiveness of our sins. In those words of Stephen, those gracious words, they remind us of the words of our Lord full of grace, when, when Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Even as the Roman soldiers were nailing him to the cross, these are words of grace. And that is how Jesus' word of grace works in your life as well. Even when your sins drove Jesus to the cross, he give you, gives you those words of grace. He forgives all your sins before you even ask for forgiveness, before you even knew that you needed forgiveness, Jesus is there on the cross forgiving you. And you know, sometimes, just on a side note, sometimes that is what is required in our Christian discipleship, is sometimes we need to forgive those who wrong us even before they ask for forgiveness. In fact, the people who wrong us might not even ever ask for forgiveness. And yet, we see from uh, Stephen's example, this grace-filled witness to Christ, that he forgave his attackers even while they were attacking him, just as his Lord forgive, forgave his, those who crucified him and just as he forgives you and I today. These are grace-filled words. We see Stephen's grace in his witness to Christ. Now, some of the words of Stephen did not seem like words of grace, I'll admit. For in um, addressing the Jewish council, whom Stephen was being tried before, Stephen calls out their sins. He points out how they and their ancestors rejected the prophets whom God sent to announce beforehand the coming of Christ. It was the very same ancestors who rejected um, Christ and rejected, I should say, who rejected the prophets who announced the coming of Christ. These also rejected uh, God by putting their trust in the temple that Solomon built, that is um, this massive, uh, beautiful structure and uh, worthy of praise to be sure. But they put their trust in the temple rather than in the God who graciously made himself present in the temple. And so Stephen calls us out, and he even refers to his accusers as stiff-necked 
and uncircumcised. Now, that would be throwing down the gauntlet if ever there was a challenge to fight uh, when, when Stephen calls them stiff-necked and uncircumcised and accuses them of being unfaithful to God. Now, these words, though they may sound harsh, are indeed compatible with grace. These words of Stephen calling out the sin of his accusers, these are indeed compatible with grace. Now, we should make a note that this is grace as opposed to niceness or being gracious as opposed to simply being nice. These words of Stephen are grace-filled words because they are calling his accusers, his attackers, to repentance. He is calling them to repentance and to be in a right relationship with the Lord their God rather than opposing him and rejecting him. Stephen's words are words of grace, calling them back to the mercy of God the Father in Jesus Christ. And we should also note that these are words of grace calling to repentance, and they're not necessarily nice, but we should note that it is not nice to let people plunge headlong into hell, thinking that they are doing good works and that that God will receive them into heaven but actually they will find a rude awakening when they wake up and find themselves in the fires of hell. It is not nice to remain silent and to uh, not call out someone's sin where there is sin and let them plunge headlong into hell. So Stephen's words are indeed full of grace. And God adds grace to grace because We read in Acts chapter 7 that the ones who attacked Stephen, the ones who murdered Stephen by stoning, they laid their coats at the the feet of a man named Saul. Now Saul, of course, we know, would go on later to be converted into Paul. And and the the, um, account of Acts also tells us that, that Saul approved of Stephen's stoning. And then Saul would go on to intensify the persecution of the church after this. And yet, it was, it was Stephen's very uh, witness that was part of the piece of the puzzle. Uh, it was one piece in the puzzle of Saul's conversion to be an apostle, a disciple of Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John chapter 12, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And we even see in death the fruit of Stephen's witness, for it was there that uh, the apostle, well, it was there that Saul began his uh, process to be converted into the apostle Paul. And then Paul would go on to preach the gospel to the Gentiles much expanding the Christian church all across the world. And today, the Christian church, the vast majority are Gentile believers. If Saul was not converted to Paul, the church today would look very different. And we might not have even heard of Jesus Christ if it wasn't for uh, God's grace in bringing Saul to repentance and to conversion. And so we see from Stephen's example that our witness to Christ is to be full of grace. That's the first element. But also, second, it is to be full of power. Our witness to Christ is to be full of power. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, sometimes it feels like my witness to Christ is a little timid, a little shy. It doesn't seem full of power. Now, in the kind of secular sense, we think of power as, you know, chest thumping, uh, thunderbolts clashing, falling from the sky, the war drum drumming. We think of power in these kind of worldly terms. But so Stephen, according to those worldly terms, he doesn't seem to be very powerful in his witness before the council. In fact, he is taken outside of the city 
to be disposed of like as much garbage and, and put down like a sick animal by stoning. Yet Stephen's power does not lie in what the world would call powerful. Rather, Stephen's powerful witness lies in the very fact of his boldness, his boldness in witness to Jesus Christ. And ultimately, his boldness rested on the power of God's word. It rested on the power of God's word to do what it accomplishes and to do what it promised to do. You see, Stephen trusted in God's word to accomplish what it promised to do. We see, we see Stephen's trust in the power of God's word. It's on full display when he is standing there before the council, cool and calm. In fact, in uh, verse 15 of the gospel, uh, I'm sorry, in verse 15 of the reading from Acts, uh, we don't have that in our, our lectionary reading this morning, but in verse 15 of chapter 6, Luke tells us that when Stephen was giving his witness, his face was like that of an angel. Stephen was standing before this powerful council, at least in worldly terms, a council that had uh, the ability to imprison Stephen, to make his life very hard, and even, as we saw, when the mob was, was stirred up into a rage to stone Stephen, to take away his life. And yet, in the face of all of that, Stephen's witness was powerful because he was cool, calm, collected, confident, and peaceful. His face was like that of an angel in his witness. That is true power. That is true power in his boldness and witness to Jesus Christ, even in the face of hostility and persecution. Stephen could have this power in his witness because he trusted in God's word. He gave the results all up to God. It was simply his job to be there to witness to Jesus Christ. It wasn't his job to convert anyone. His job was there to share the testimony about Jesus Christ with power and leave the results up to God. Now, it is important to note that in our witness to Jesus Christ, we may not always see the results, for they may come somewhere down the line, just like with the conversion of Saul. Stephen did not get to see Saul converted to the Apostle Paul. That happened after his death. But rather, Stephen gave his witness to Jesus Christ with grace and power, and he left the rest up to God. So, we do not need to be timid in our witness to Jesus Christ. But rather, we should trust in the power of God's word. We should trust in the power of God's word and give our witness with grace-filled words in our witness to Jesus Christ. Because even if we should face hostility and persecution, even persecution that would lead to our death, we know that along with Stephen, we shall see God the Father sitting on the throne and Jesus Christ standing at his right hand, waiting to receive us there into heaven, saying, well done, my good, uh, well done, good servant. So we give our witness with grace and with power to our Lord, our risen Lord, Jesus Christ. And now the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. Amen. At this time, we continue with the offering.
We continue with the prayers of the church. In our prayers this morning, we will be praying especially for Mary Giese, the wife of Mike Giese. Uh, Mary has uh, her last chemo tri- chemotherapy uh, appointment coming up next week, and hopefully um, it is the last, and uh, she is can- cancer-free after that. So uh, we keep Mary in our prayers, and uh, we pray for uh, gracious healing in her life. I will conclude each prayer petition with, Lord, in your mercy, to which the congregation responds, hear our prayer. Let us pray. As newborn infants, we long for the pure spiritual milk. So let us come before the Lord seeking his mercy, with confidence that his grace will be sufficient for all our needs. Almighty Father, everlasting God, Your Son has revealed you to us as a merciful Lord. Give to us your Holy Spirit that we may believe in him whom you have sent and do the greater works he has told us we will do in his name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Eternal Father, just like Stephen, the first martyr, you have raised up witnesses in every age and blessed us with those who endured suffering and even death and faithfulness to Christ. We give you thanks for these faithful saints and martyrs, and we pray you to make us strong in our witness, that it might be full of grace and power. As we face the day-to-day trial that is in our lives, and that at length we may be brought with the martyrs into the joy of your presence and the glory of everlasting life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, you have promised to build up your church, to be a holy priesthood, that your people might offer the spiritual sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving acceptable to you. Bless your church and bring all congregations back together again. Bless all pastors who proclaim Christ to us. Bless all church workers and those preparing for full-time church vocations that your church may be supplied with faithful and wise leaders and servants of your word. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, you have established the home and bless those who show us your love. Bless all mothers and the children in their care. Make their homes places of blessing and love, where your word is spoken, forgiveness reigns, and love is displayed. Give us good examples to inspire youth to all that is good and pure, and to seek after these things. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, your power brought all things into being, and still you preserve what you have made. Bless our President, the Congress of these United States, our Governor, and all elected and appointed civil servants, so that, so that they may honor you and your purpose establishing order and justice, encouraging virtue, and protecting all life. Give wisdom and moderation to them in their leadership for the well-being of our nation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O merciful Father, you have compassion upon the sick and those in need, and have promised not to ignore them in their afflictions. Turn back the pandemic across the globe and give us relief. Bless the sick with healing, those who suffer with strength and patience, and the dying with peace. Hear us on behalf of those who have requested prayers, especially Mary Giese. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Compassionate Father, you are not aloof from the needs of this body and life, and you have called us to love our neighbor in need and give aid to the poor. Give us courage and faith that we may not fear sharing the resources you have supplied with those who live and want, especially the widow, the orphan, and the unemployed. Let love be perfected among us to drive our selfish fears away. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We praise you, God, for your goodness in hearing the prayers of your people and granting us confidence to approach your throne of mercy. Hear us now in the name of and for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom, with whom, and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, 
both now and forever. Amen. O God, you make the minds of your faithful to be of one will. Grant that we may love what you have commanded and desire what you promise, that among the many changes of this world, our hearts may be fixed where true joys are found. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue on page 266 of your hymnal as we pray together the morning prayer. Page 266. We pray. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger, and I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings and life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. We continue with the New Testament canticle on page 266 of your hymnal. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless and preserve you. Amen. We continue with our closing hymn, hymn number 722, Lord, Take My Hand and Lead Me.
Thank you for joining us on this fifth Sunday of Easter. Uh, we are reminded by St. Stephen that our witness to Jesus Christ is full of grace and full of power. Again, a very happy Mother's Day uh, to all of you mothers out there. Um, go have quarantine brunch, whatever that looks like for you. And remember to leave a digital handshake, a comment, a like, um, share this video on Facebook, YouTube, and, and use it as a way to get that witness to Jesus Christ out there on the internet. Um, I'll see you this week on Wednesday for the First Corinthians Bible study, and then again I'll see you uh, next Sunday for the sixth Sunday of Easter. Until then, God's peace be with you.